Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Search Podcast. So, my name is Saud, and for today, I thought we'd talk about uh, something that might sound relatively boring, but I can guarantee you this will be the most interesting talk on documentation you've ever had in your life from anybody, including anybody at HR or patient safety. It may not be the most exciting, but it will be the most interesting because it took a little bit of effort to make this sound good. So the inspiration for this talk was um, one of my junior residents who um, sort of had a dis heated discussion with me after an incredibly long call. He had about 30 activations overnight and um, he just lost it because modern healthcare systems being what they are, half of it is on an EMR, on a computer system, an electronic medical record, and the other half is done by hand. Now, we're lucky on, in our unit in that we use checkboxes, so you can fill in about, I would say, 35 items of checkboxes, no jokes, and you'll have all your admission orders done, your full history and physical examination done, complete documentation if you're primary in your secondary survey, and all you have to do is take pictures of that and put a copy in the chart. And then I might do a whole thing on, on how to document in trauma. It has to be quick and it has to be checkboxes because it's a limited amount of data in your data set that you actually need to be able to produce high fidelity reconstructions of events. But anyways, and the rest of it, he has to sort of input and interact with a computer at the same time. And he just lost it because, you know, it, it, the team has five people usually to six people on it on any given day. But I think that the stress of having 30 activations would be enough for anybody to lose it after a 12-hour shift. So he just like, uh, we had a very heated discussion about why we need to document things. And at the time, I could tell that he needed some sleep. So I just um, chalked it down to the fact that you need to document because we need to know what's happening to patients and for legal purposes. Uh, here's my more interesting answer uh, now that he's calmed down. And um, I, I, I apologize for picking on you. But, you know, it is what it is. So documentation and AI, I think, are going to be intimately linked in the future just by looking at the way that the industry is moving and other industries have moved with this. So just looking at why we document and how we document, the first form of documentation that you can find is in a uh, medical anthropology book. And this is one of the first pieces. You can actually find it in uh, the Smithsonian right now. It's part of their collection. And it's called Navajo Medicine and Sand and Rock. And we're not sure when it was, but it was prehistoric. And it depicts uh, spirit animals, the shaman uh, with the light emanating from his head, dancing around the patient, trying to free them of spirits, evil spirits. That's what it shows. And, and the symbolism uh, tells you that, you know, three basic principles that have been around from prehistory till about, I'd say, 500-ish BC. The first principle was that priesthood and healing people were, was intimately linked. The second was disease was considered an omen, a bad omen, that would require some religious help and support. And the third was that they had to write down how to do it right so that the next generation can benefit. And those three things seem to have um, been distilled into what we do nowadays in terms of multidisciplinary care, in terms of the way that we uh, document things. And you, you can even see it in Mesopotamia around 500 BC. Uh, they documented various forms of astrology. Uh, the right time to do things uh, based on the uh, calendar at the time in Mesopotamia. They also documented what type of chants to use, what types of spirits, and how to prepare concoctions and potions in this manner. And this was documented in cuneiform, which is uh, probably one of the first writing systems. It was around, around the time of the Sumerians and lasted till just after the Ashurians. I would say. It was around for, for quite a long time, about give or take 800 to 1,000 years. And the writing style allowed different cultures living along the Fertile Crescent 
to exchange data between them. It also meant that there was a recipe for treating disease. Again, sticking to the same theme. And fast forward to Egypt, about 1500 BC, and uh, this was around about the time of uh, Ptolemy the I, the second, probably. And you started to see um, priests who were dedicated to certain gods or deities at the time that specialized in healthcare or specialized in life and death situations. And those priests wrote what they did for patients and what they observed so that the next generation can learn from them. Now, this included uh, extremely, extremely detailed descriptions of how to cast uh, arms and legs that were broken, uh, how to perform trepanation, and how to perform uh, pulse checks, and what hemodynamic shock really was, right? Uh, in, at that time, it was still defined as, as a sign of death as opposed to a, a, a sign of a sick patient. You were beyond the point that they could treat. But they had defined that. Uh, what type of last rites people would have to do. How to prepare bodies uh, for mummification and for burial. And for cremation. Uh, all of these things were the jobs of these special healthcare priests. And I think that was the start of physicianship, you could say, more or less. It was around about that time that we were starting to see that. 1,000 years later, and we're still using papyrus. This time, the person who used it is allegedly Hippocrates. Now, the Hippocratic corpus, I have issues with this time period. Uh, the first issue is that it was very um, romantically interpreted by certain people in the 1960s to the 1980s, and that people kept telling us that Hippocrates came up with the oath, and it's the Hippocratic oath, and that he wrote the Hippocratic Corpus that contained uh, multiple chapters of how to treat uh, patients. And, uh, you know, that body of work uh, dictated what would eventually be the scientific method in medicine, although at the time it was considered mainly philosophical. My issue is that, number one, the Hippocratic Corpus was transcribed by Hippocrates and attributed to him because he collected 19 authors to write the first book, effectively. Now, these 19 authors wrote multiple collections that were transcribed by him, and they were distributed by him. And they were distributed in papyrus form and in uh, terracotta form, on specialized types of clay uh, that contained uh, some of the writings. And, you know, I think we should give him credit for that, but not necessarily attribute the oath to him, and I'm probably going to do a whole episode on who I really think wrote the Hippocratic Oath. Moving forward, and about 300 years later, 200 years later, you started to get physicians who were philosophers, much like Hippocrates, but didn't have very strong religious underpinnings. And there were people like Galen, who was a Stoic philosopher and a physician. So Galen wrote about 14 to 17 books that were attributed to him. More than likely, half of them were probably written by him. This is one example of a book that was transcribed to Greek around about the time of his death, around about 200 AD. And the interesting thing was that you, you had the Greek form before you had the Latin form, which was extremely significant. It meant that Physicianship or being a physician was still considered a, a, a plebeian job at the time, or a commoner's job. And the second thing was that the descriptions that he wrote included three different fonts of information combined together. So he was writing what would eventually become the method in physiology, effectively. Now, he got a lot of things wrong. He completely messed up circulation, I think. He got a lot of things wrong, but there were three things that he got right. The first was that he observed vivisection, so he did living dissections of animals to look at different aspects of them that were close to human beings and use that to figure stuff out dynamically, as opposed to just uh, dissecting gladiators. The second was he treated living human beings like gladiators, 
wrestlers, Olympians, athletes, and people who were injured as actors. So he was probably like the first trauma surgeon. Galen spent a significant amount of time trying to figure out what he's, if what he saw in animals was directly relevant to humans, and he did that by dissecting the cadavers of gladiators or by treating gladiators, and he wrote massive notes based on this. Daily diaries. And these notes included what he felt was relevant in the correct manner. The problem was that he wasn't 100% sure what was relevant. And so you get fragmented notes that, that are written with the main body as Galen would have, have seen it, as you can see, and then notes on the side from people who remember the event. And that's the way that people used Galen's books. They used them as a living record for what recipes worked, but they also supplemented hearsay. Because fast forward by 20, 30 years, and people figured out that, you know, trying to fix a brachial artery using a fat pad doesn't work. She literally tried. But if you have an infected chest wound and the infection has reached the bone, removing the sternum, letting the skin dry out with honey dressing, and then closing it later in a delayed fashion did work. He literally did that. So he did the world's first sternectomy for an infection. That's how he treated an infection. Uh, taking different uh, meats and putting them into pots that were open and closed to see that if you, you closed the pot and created a seal, would it reduce the risk of infection was something else that he did. He also found that flies and maggots cleaned the meat. So all of these things put together and lived on it, obviously. So all these things put together, Galen probably started what would be the first real textbook. While Hippocrates collected people and was an editor, Galen was like the guy who wanted to write the book on his own. So, you know, Galen was like Guyton back in the 80s. And a lot of what Galen wrote after the fall of the Roman Empire ended up being translated to Arabic. It was translated to Arabic because at the time, Europe was just going into the Dark Age phase. Um, and not getting into anything specifically theological, um, the Arabs were starting uh, to not only understand Greek better, but um, had at the time thought of themselves as part of the Roman Empire. The Middle East or Middle Arabia was part of the Roman Empire. And this is a translation of the 14th book that Galen wrote called On Usefulness of the Parts. And a lot of what he says in this book is extrapolated as what we call negative feedback loops what we call homeostasis. Those ideas came from that book. And what Arabs routinely did was they, they actually pressed these in translation. So it wasn't, they built a printing press to be able to press these and then add their own handwritten notes to supplement it. And by the time of Vesalius in the 1500s, uh, patient records had been converted from stories that were handwritten uh, two illustrations uh, showing trepanation, and they included, so Andrus Vesalius actually tried to prove Galen wrong, and he did, but they included dissections of things like the diaphragm, prosections, and things like that, and uh, they included illustrations that showed specific clinical encounters. So the driver up to that point was education, and around about the 17 to 1800s, that continued, and Europe was just starting to get out of the Dark Ages. You were just starting to get people who were apothecaries separating from people who were surgeons and barbers separating from physicians. And at the time, Walter Cannon, who was part of the Harvard Medical School, which was a school that had nothing to do with the rest of Harvard at the time, and I'll get to why that was a problem later, had had a discussion with the students about keeping case logs. And in fact, at the time, he had alluded to the fact that unlike surgeons, who only had to apply a trade and learn two or three variations of it, physicians oftentimes had to remember patients' details because they had to live with their patients. There, I suppose that there was some wisdom to that given the practice at the time. I don't know. Fast forward a little bit longer, or a little bit more, and these case logs by 1858 had included patient names, had included um, different locations, and had included conclusions. But they were still being written in a haphazard manner, 
And essentially, it was like you're reading something that Hippocrates wrote, because it was the thoughts at the time written in diary format. However, in 1899, we were introduced to a new driver, thanks to the New York Hospital. So the New York Hospital was under public trust and was using government funding. Because they were using government funding, they had to prove the number of patients that they saw. They had to prove that they were doing their jobs. And so what they had was a list of patients with a list of why they came in. Now, there was no documentation in terms of the order that they came in, details of their admission, details of how much they were billed for, or details of what they did to the patients, apart from a provisional diagnosis that was scribbled in. And as you can see, there are things like slept at the interrail, written down, uh, poor nutrition and uh, sensation the left leg, three blocks down. So, you know, it, it was a very haphazard list of patients that would walk in through the door. And... This was around about 1899, but it was starting to transition from being driven by education and trying to figure things out exclusively to actually requiring hospital statistics to justify your presence as a hospital. And so you were getting meticulous records of the patients that came in, but none of the clinical details at this point. This lasted for about 30 to 40 years until people started to write discharge summaries. And the reason why discharge summaries were being asked for was because, like I alluded to, people didn't know what was happening to the patients. And New York Hospital was getting a little bit of flack in the press, as was the Bellevue at the time. Basically, it was a bad time to work in healthcare in New York, just as a one-liner, right? And so they were writing discharge summaries for the patients who survived, and that was considered a record of what you did for the patient. But as you can see, this wasn't the discharge summary that we know today, and there was no real ICD-10 or 9 coding. Something strange started to happen around about 1889, though, in terms of the admissions. So every patient that was admitted had a number up top that was pre-printed. And you had a provisional diagnosis written up top, like thrombophlebitis, as you can see. And you had the patient's name, and then you had their history, and a daily account of what was done. This was a little bit strange. You were also starting to get more itemized viewings by 1899, 10 years later, when you had patients' respiratory rate, pulse, heart rate being written down, physical examination findings written down in an orderly fashion for every patient on the ward. And the driver then was legal. So at the time, the Harvard football team included people from their medical school and lawyers. And some of the people from the medical school had noted that the Harvard Law School had a significant system in place for how they structured the briefings on previous cases. And so the people who trained at the medical school adopted that paradigm into medicine. And H.S. Plummer was probably one of the first people to introduce it outside of Harvard in the Mayo Clinic of plummer Vinson syndrome, obviously. And what he introduced was not only the structure of the medical record, with a history, physical examination, past medical, surgical history, etc. I can't even say it in the right order, but he also introduced a medical record number system so that every patient had a medical record that you could refer to. With all of these things in place, it's no surprise that by 1922, you had medical writers who would take the handwritten notes that were scribbles and then convert them into typed up chart records that they would keep in the chart. And these became our ward attendants that we rely on now. Since then, we've had the same basic structure for all of our medical records. There's a personal identification number, there's a medical history, a family medical history, medication history, a treatment history, and medical directives. The driver for this was not only the scientific aspect of things that we had seen from the time of prehistory uh, in the Navajo Indians until modern day, in modern day case series and case reports. There was a secondary driver around about the 1960s and the 1970s, and that was billing. We were starting to bill in an efficient manner. And in addition to that, accountability legally. From then on, we developed our fanciful little folders, our forms that we could check, bo check boxes on, and structured written notes. In addition to that, we were introduced to the um, electronic medical record. Now, the electronic medical record at the time was probably designed 
with the primary driver being the fact that there was a computer on the desk, if we're going to be honest. So I, I did a little bit of research on this uh, just by looking at older machines. So this is an EMR from 2009, and it's not that great, okay? But earlier machines made it easier for you to bill and made it easier for you to retrieve patient information while sitting at the desk. It did not make it easier for you to type anything in. And even with this, I think that we can all agree, we all have the same complaints about EMRs, even the newer ones like this one, which is an open source EMR that shouldn't cost anything, quote unquote. You know, our complaints center around the level of difficulty. So the green box is what we see. There are about 16 different databases coming into and out of what you see on the screen. Each of those 16 harbors at least nine data points. So nine different itemized pieces of data. Those systems interact with each other, not automatically, but for the most part manually. All the dotted lines are manual inputs. And so when you do that to a doctor who has a very busy day, you make him write on this thing, and then write on this thing, and then try and figure out which parts he has to duplicate onto this thing and schedule on this thing and order requests on this thing and then figure out how they all interact with each other and make sure that he's dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. Expect to hear this after 35 activations. So now we're at the point where, you know, we've developed a very robust electronic healthcare system. And we do type up most of our notes in most centers. I'll be honest, in our center, we still have handwritten notes. But it, we're hoping that it'll change with time. But the method of entry and the, the time it takes, you know, it's, it's been studied. It takes away from patient care to an extent, one could argue. The time it takes for us to document things electronically has been traditionally reported as being at least 20 to 30 percent of our day of our working day. Now, part of it is um, the fact that 10 years ago, we weren't as good as computers as we are now. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people who grew up with computers. I have no problem programming. I actually enjoy it. I have no life. Um, but, you know, I'm okay with coding. Uh, but people about five years older than I am, maybe 10 years older than I am, I can see their frustration because it wasn't organic to them to sit on a bulletin board service for six hours a day, typing things up and joking around and sending off uh, animated GIFs. Like, they never did that. We did. So for us, it's a little bit easier. I don't think that that's the main problem. I think the main problem, having used enough of them without naming any names, is the fact that they're not designed by computer people. They're not designed by, by professionals of programming, in my humble opinion. And, you know, I might be wrong, but if you show a programmer something that looks like this, a real systems programmer who works in a different uh, sector, okay, and you tell them that this is how you want things to be done, and this is your standard. And by the way, this standard is not dictated by you or me. It's a legal standard. It has to be a HIPAA compliant standard. There has to be segregation to the database systems. It has to be done like that, okay? But... If I told them that this was our standard, they'd be shocked. Just backing this up without any data breaches would be a problem. And guess what? It is a problem. We've all seen it in the news, right? Patient data breaches, despite best efforts made. And your end users aren't very happy about it. But I think that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And the reason why I have some hope is because, you know, in other sectors, similar systems do exist now. So in the financial sector, there's this thing called FinTech, financial tech. The investment systems, crowdfunding systems and delivery systems, online banking, digital money, research and extrapolation, exchange, payment, and blockchains, effectively money that's based online and pegged to online factors, all of these things are all under fintech. And they all interact with each other in an extremely complex way. And they all offset each other in an extremely complex way. But the system works. 
and it's robust and it's redundant. It may not save everybody, but it does the most for the most people without people actively having to look after each other's interests. If we had a robust healthcare IT infrastructure that's very similar and mirrors the values that are invested in fintech as a complex system, my prediction is our documentation is going to be vital. And the reason why it's going to be vital is because with better computer systems, and this is just uh, in JAX this month, um, what we're seeing is an ability to automatically extract surgical data, extract fitness data, and feed it into a data quality check engine that can build study-specific and foundational models. So you can automatically have most of the stuff that we manually document fed into it. And this system is available right now. This has just been published this month. So we will only have to add our part, the data that we get from the patient and not from the computer itself. I think that that's the first step forward. It's to make it easier to use by not making us redundant, by not having the computer replace our role, but having whatever the computer system does right now, whatever's being fed in here through this system, continuing to be fed in automatically and supplementing it with the data that we contribute, we're more likely to develop a stronger research base. And the reason why I say that is the way that AI is moving forward right now. So in FinTech, this is a standard. AI is standard. It's not used to take over any person's job although there are those fears. It's used to give you better insight into what can and should happen. So the first layer of it is what we call AI or artificial intelligence. And these are basically automatic responses to commands. They're not really that, but that's one type of them. And, and for all intents and purposes, you should probably think of, of, of that as, uh, as AI. If, if, you're, if you're pure healthcare, and this is a bit confusing for you, and I've already lost you after um, the Byzantine Empire, just think of it as a computer with a list of pre-made responses for any given descriptor, any given command that you give it. So for example, if you say, hey Alexa, um, order me coffee, Alexa says yes, is automatic, whether the coffee is ordered or not. That's effectively what it is. Machine learning is the part where Alexa knows how to order the coffee for you. And machine learning can be fed in two ways. The first way is for you to give it an algorithm that you already know and a data set for it to work on, like a list of commands and what these commands equate to in terms of communicating with online services. The second way is to allow the computer to take a data set and the preset output and figure out its own algorithm. And that's called deep learning. Deep learning is when you tell the computer how many times I order coffee during a preset period of time, what type of coffee I like, and the computer figures out the best way to make sure that I never have to order coffee again. That's what deep learning is. I'm kind of lying, but that's what it is. And if you want to look at subtypes, just as a brief example, interactive AI is basically chatbots, right? Preset answers. Functional AI is automatic machines that can order things for you and that can type things up for you, that can restock things for you. Segmental analysis and risk assessment is analytical AI. Visual AI is the interpretation of pictures and producing findings or data off of them. And text AI is the ability to read your text effectively, whether it's handwritten or not. The, the technical term is uh, neuro-linguistic uh, interpretation, NLP. So with these things in place, what would be the equivalent medical tool set? Major implications, right? So the ethics of us having a medical tool set where we would presumably have these companies that used to be electronic healthcare record companies, figuring out that the money's not in the software itself, the money's in this. 
So interactive AI is your patient's ability to start giving you a history while they're on the way to see you. So they wake up in the morning with abdominal pain, they put in an appointment for you, they write down their chief complaint, they write down their past medical and surgical history, their social history on their mobile phone app, and they book the appointment. Because you already have a query appendicitis coming in, and you know that it's coming in as a walk into the emergency room, the nurse already knows to triage it accordingly. She double checks the vitals, or he double checks the vitals for you, and then you get called. You get called and you're already expecting the patient. The paging system automatically pulls up the patient's data on the smartphone, confirms the vitals and triage level. You can go assess your patient, add your relevant notes, and the computer will already have allocated space for the patient for a possible CT scan or ultrasound based on the preliminary labs that you have ordered. Patient goes to the CT scanner, gets the CT scan, and you get a preliminary, high, highly sensitive and highly specific AI reading of the CT scan, off of the CT scanning machine itself. This is fed back to you and fed back to the patient on his smartphone or her smartphone. So there's a complete transparency. The patient knows that the lab tests are coming up. And you know that the patient knows that the lab tests are coming up. And there's a chatbot that explains things to the patient so that the patient gets the sense of urgency if they need it or the lack thereof. And all the while, you have enough time to see all your patients. The patients are being scheduled in a correct manner. And because there's some patient tracking going on somewhere in there, thanks to this deep learning algorithm, the call schedule will get fixed in the right way. And your outcomes get recorded. And based on your outcomes, you can actually find out which courses you should take how to get more academic staffing, which conferences you should go to, which benefits, which patients would benefit more from Dr. A versus Dr. B. And you can develop propensity scores for how likely a pelvic fracture is to bleed. That's another paper that came up literally this week, Journal of Trauma. So then you have to ask yourself, where is the impact here? How are these companies going to make money? Are they going to make money off of the software, the EMR software? I don't think so. They're going to give it to us for free because they need the data. It's kind of like Facebook, right? But then what's the ethics of that? Are they going to sell you data pools to be able to do your research? Or are they going to do the research by themselves? Or is patient collecting patient data going to be a thing of the past? Is it just going to be, listen, for the patient to book with our hospital net network, they have to give us their data because that will benefit everybody else in the hospital network. And it's unethical for me to treat this patient if they're not willing to contribute to our data pool. Could that be an argument to be made? The ethics of it aren't very clean. People automatically assume that the ethics of AI is a question of the computers taking over. In my mind, the ethics of AI is, at least in healthcare, where's the data gonna come from? And how do you present the data? And what do you do when you know that the algorithm is invalid and where does the money come from in the end? Is it from the algorithm itself? Is it from the data pool? Or is it from the EMR data collection software? Or is it from conducting trials? Because now that you have deep learning, trials can be done with a significantly smaller number of patients and have a higher resolution of data. So it's all stuff to think about, right? The ethics of a patient not letting you use their data, but requesting to be seen by you, and treated by your algorithms as a healthcare network. The ethics of an electronic healthcare record company giving you their software for free, so long as they get to keep the algorithm and charge you for it. And let's be honest, the ethics of you not documenting correctly. If I know that in 10 years time, all the stuff that I'm putting into my electronic healthcare record or my trauma registry or my code team registry, or my ICU database is going to be reviewed and is going to be of benefit to other patients. How ethical is it for somebody to blatantly refuse to document? How ethical is it for me to write a two-line note? Knowing that this could be the way that we're going to cure cancer in 10 to 15 years time. The way that we're going to figure out if pelvic fractures bleed, right? Because this requires massive amounts of data. So two to three years of Acura is nothing for deep learning. It's nothing. It's a nothing data set. Think about how much data is on in the stock market 
And they've been collecting this data since 1990. On any given day, the data equivalent of, of, of the New York Stock Exchange would be all of the records that you would have in a level one trauma center. And that's just one day. All the records they would have in a level one trauma center that's been functioning for a whole year. You're talking about no less than three terabytes of data per day including backup on the New York Stock Exchange. So it's it's not it's not cut and dry, right? We're going to need massive amounts of data to be able to produce this slick healthcare system and we're going to need it to be documented correctly. And you know, we're back to square one. We're still using the data to figure out how to treat patients even better than we did before on those cave paintings. So that's why it's important to document even when you have 30 activations. The ethics of you not documenting, knowing what you know now, that in 10 to 15 years time, this data is going to be looked at by our robot overlords, and we're going to have better and better algorithms to treat our patients, means that you really have no excuse. So this is Saud al -Zaid, and um, I'm sorry if this was boring. For me, it was very interesting, but I have no life. Uh, please subscribe. And if you thought that this was boring, suggest some more interesting topics. Have a good day.